guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is the daily show where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and we hope you all had a fun, festive, and safe Halloween last night. Also here, host of Collider Heroes, John Schnepp. Man, I can't wait to get to that Xander Cage trailer. It's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> man, it's a little bit down the list, but man, are we going to talk about that. <laughs> also your host of Jedi Council, Christian Harloff. Well, I missed yesterday, so I want to thank everybody that came out to the Collider Schmodown panel at uh, LA Comic Con. Standing room only, a lot of fun. And yes, it will be up on the channel probably on Thursday. Also here, Mark Ellis. Triple X! The return <laughs> of Xander Cage. All right, let's get started. Okay. According to a report from THR, Warner Brothers' big screen take on the Scarlet Speedster, The Flash, has lost its director. Director Rick Famuyiwa, who was hired onto the superhero project after finding success with his coming-of-age Sundance sensation Dope has parted ways with the studio over dreaded creative differences. The departure of Fama Yuo will likely mean the delay of the movie's start of production and release date. John, thoughts on The Flash losing director Rick Fama Yuo? This is not the first time they've lost a director over creative differences, and theoretically speaking, this is kind of the third director they've gone through. Because originally, although it was never you know, made official, but we know Lord and Miller were kind of looking at maybe doing The Flash. Then we had Graham Smith sign on and do it, left over creative differences. They call it scheduling things, but we found out it was creative differences. And then, now this, over creative differences. This is what I do not understand about a director departing over creative differences. And I've mentioned this before, and it is still boggles my mind. How do you not get on the same page creatively before you announce you've hired the director? Like, isn't that one of the most important things you do before you announce that we have hired on this director? Is that you sit down many times, many meetings, many strategy sessions going over with them, saying, what is our creative vision for this movie? And then once you find the guys like, yes, we're creatively on the same page, then you announce that you have a director. I do not understand this whole thing where, you know, how did you hire this guy in the first place? This guy who clearly knows how to tell a really good story because Dope was amazing. How do you bring this guy on only to later discover that you have creative differences, you're not on the same page creatively? Like who's not doing their job right? Who's not doing their job right that this doesn't come up in your creative meetings? And then it brings up a bigger question. Look, we, we're now three down, three sets of directors down. Should we be worried? Is this Jeff Johns thing having creative control? Is this a problem? Now, that's total speculation. Could be many, many other things. Many, many other things. So don't read too much into that. But this is concerning to me that this happens again so late in the game. Now, the movie's in 2018, but they're supposed to get moving on like actual in front of the camera production in a number of months. You already know pre-production stuff is already happening at this point. Mm -hmm. So how do you lose this guy at this point? Now, a lot of people I've been reading, both messaging me on Twitter and online, trying to compare this to the Edgar Wright situation and saying, oh, well, you know, they had the same problem with Edgar Wright. No, 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 that was a totally different scenario. That was a scenario where they brought a director on, then five years pass, and the Marvel Cinematic Universe had taken on a life of its own and had become a certain thing that no longer fit with what that vision for Ant-Man was, and the two mutually creative, uh, depart, uh, split creative ways. And that was perfectly fine and the movie worked out great. This isn't that situation. This is a totally different situation. So while I love Ezra Miller on his Flash, I like what they did with Flash so far, both with his cameo in Suicide Squad and with how they used him and Batman v Superman, I've been looking forward to this movie a lot, but I am a little bit concerned about, look, this isn't the first director. If this was the first director they parted ways with, fine. But now we're on three and counting. And to me, that's a little bit concerning. Is it time to yell panic and dive overboard? No, no. But I'm just saying, I do feel a little bit concerned at this point. I know, Schnepp, am I overreacting to this? Is there something to this, or is this just normal business as usual in Hollywood? Well, I mean, no, it's not normal. I mean, you know, uh, this reminds me of like Annie Get a Gun with like Natalie right, Portman. Portman. This is like yeah. bad news. <laughs> Annie got a gun. Yeah, or whatever it was called. <laughs> you know, Jane, like, who had Jane lost yeah. her weapon. Whatever Annie it was did called. Have Jane one lost point. her yeah. weapon. Yeah, yeah. Find she got it, it from now, Annie. Buried on Netflix somewhere. I'm just saying it's like that didn't work out. That didn't really work out well. And that had multiple actors changing, directors multiple changing. Multiple directors, yeah. Um, this is starting to feel like that. And that is bad. So to me, it's bad news. It's like, especially when you have someone as talented 
as a Fumiya. I don't know how to say his last Famuyiwa. name. Famuyiwa. Famuyiwa. I mean, Famuyiwa. I, I love, learned it from uh, Dale from Chippendales Rescue Rangers. Actually, covered this on Collider yeah. News yesterday. Dale was very smart yeah. about saying his name. Thank you, Mark. Um, <laughs> anyway, this guy Rick is how I'm going to refer to him. Very talented guy. I loved Dope, and I was looking forward to his take. Especially over all the the whole last like half year of tweets of like seeing stacks of comic books, seeing stacks of things, him doing his research, getting into the role of writing and getting prepared to direct this Flash movie. Now to see it come to a halt, and now he's leaving due to creative differences. Creative differences is a vast, you know, it can be very large amount. Big of, umbrella. Yeah, it's like we don't know yet what those creative differences are. Like Tim Miller, creative differences. We've heard lots of different versions of stories now involving this, involving that. We don't know what's true, but I mean, we don't know anything yet right now about this. Unfortunately, you're right. It's three strikes, you're out, or what's gonna happen with this? I mean, to me, it's it has to, they it has to have come to some kind of, we're 100% with you, and then some little thing that he had written into the script, they were like, no, we're not doing that because we've changed this thing unjustly and we want you to, it could be that kind of thing that happened with Edgar Wright. That's why I could see the comparison, even though there's five years versus six months, it could be a thing where, look, we are changing Justice League and we want you to not just have Cyborg, but we want all, it could just be this thing that they were trying to shoehorn in and he felt uncomfortable about it. No, that's a, that's a very good point. But even then, doesn't that raise a little bit of a flag yes. at that point too? Or maybe he's pulling, maybe he pulled a Will Smith and he wanted to get his girlfriend in the lead role. I mean, I don't know. But I don't know, Christian, you hear about all this. What's, what's your reaction to it when, when it first hits you? Oh, I agree with you guys. This is concerning. And I'll tell you why it's concerning is because the problem is, even though Suicide Squad, Batman vs. Superman, and Man of Steel all were profitable films, they have not been like universally loved by critics and fans. It just right. hasn't happened yet. So there is this sense of, we got to make the perfect product. We have, And I, I don't think that they should be trying to catch up with Marvel, but I'm sure that they are. They're, try, they're trying to put in, they want people to love what they're doing over there the same way that people love sure, Marvel. every creator does. Of course. Yeah. But I think that it's getting in the way a little bit here because you because you guys are right. When you bring on a director initially, especially the director of Dope, when you see what The Flash has become, even in that Justice League clip, they're, they're doing similar to what they're doing in Spider-Man Homecoming, giving a little bit more humor, giving a little more flair, and, and a coming-of-age type story. Who better to do that than this dude? Did mm -hmm. you say if you saw Dope, he was perfect for yeah. this. This was great, and like you said, he was doing his research. So what happened in between that time going that vision? Because I'm telling you, you're, you're right. They did come up with that vision first. You don't hire somebody and be like, you want to do it? Sure, yeah, we'll talk about what you want to do later. They yeah. come up, here's my pitch. I think it should be this, I think it should be that. And then there's these, the, the WB, this is the problem with the way that, I, again, I and, and let it come, I don't care. The difference between what Marvel does and what DC does, when you have someone like Feige, who is the guy who says, this is where we're running stuff here, we're putting it all together, Warner Brothers still has their execs. And that's not to say that Bob Iger doesn't have a say in, in Marvel movies, of course he does, but he gets the product when Feige is comfortable going, here, we need your notes here, we're ready, we're confident enough. Warner Brothers is just all in there, and whether or not they have someone in place, I don't buy it yet, because this type of stuff wouldn't happen, because you have someone, because the, the Edgar Wright thing is completely different, like you were saying, that he was attached a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's, too many cooks in the kitchen. That's what it seems like to me, to where hire a, a director that you're confident with, and when you're confident with him, let him do his thing, because it takes me back to Gavin Hood doing right. X-Men Origins, yep. and, it's, yep. and it's a different, a little bit of a different scenario, but it's that you get a guy with the movie Satsi, which is an amazing film, you give him Wolverine, and then you, you just bully him. I'm not saying this is what happened here where he got bullied, but too much going on to where the director goes, forget it, this is too much for me. I right. thought I was gonna be able to make my movie. I get it's a big movie here, I get I've done a smaller movie, but you took me on for my vision, either let me do it or I'm gonna walk, and he walked. Now, it should be, we should point out at this point that we are forming some, some opinions here based on a few nuggets of information that we have. There could be a million other nuggets of information that we don't know yet right. that could completely change our perspective of this. But all we can do is comment on the information we do have. So Mark, with the information that we have in front of us, What's your response to it? Here's some informative dipping sauce for your nuggets, John. <laughs> is that whether you're talking about Edgar Please Wright... Please don't talk about my or, nuggets. Or you're talking about uh, Rick Famuyiwa, it, it's the same sort of situation in context of you're taking somebody on and there's a certain leap of faith you have to make because this is a hot property director that you want to lock up for a film. So if you have meetings and you seem to have a similar creative vision, that can change if your whole studio is course correcting over what happened with Batman v Superman and with Suicide Squad. 
Squad, which we clearly saw an indication of that at Comic-Con, where it seemed like they were going with a lighter tone with a little bit more fun from what we saw with Justice League and what we saw with Wonder Woman. So maybe that didn't jive with what Rick wanted to do with The Flash, but it's very disappointing to me because I really wanted to see what he was going to do. Yeah, me so too. when you talk about that huge umbrella of creative differences, that could be he didn't like somebody's face at work. That could be he didn't <laughs> like the way the script for well, The I Flash was going. Or the, <laughs> they, we have a lot of creative differences here in the studio. But it could also be less about his movie, The Flash, and more about how much The Flash was going to be tying in to the rest of Justice League. Because there's two things you have to... Con this is not a standalone movie like Dope was. Dope was great. That's a standalone movie that didn't need to tie into a larger universe. The Flash certainly does have to do that. So maybe that's where the discrepancies lie. It really is a bummer, too, because he was instrumental in helping bring on Kiersey Clemens to this project, who I think is going to be great in The Flash, but now she doesn't have the director who did such a great job with her in Dope. So it really is disappointing. And when you hear that it's the third director that, or fourth, if you want to count Lord Miller, two different people that are not going to be involved with Flash anymore, we're running out of people. Yeah, you I know. know. And the other thing to keep in mind too here is this: if we do want to draw a little bit of an analogy to the uh, Edgar Wright situation, hey, they had to make a switch. We ended up with Peyton Reed, which caught a lot of people by surprise, and Ant Man ended up being awesome. So, hey, look, that none of this means that Flash won't be awesome. Right. I, it, because it could very well, this might be the best thing to happen for the Flash. Who knows? We're just going to have to wait and see. And even that, Adam McKay was actually attached for like a day or two, That's too, true, before yeah. they, and then they lost him, and people went nuts going, uh oh, oh it's mm -hmm. man's going to be their first stinker, and the Peyton Reed, oh, it's just going to be jokes the whole day long. And that worked out. Yeah, but Adam stayed on, on board, though, and fin didn't he do the fin right. final yeah, polish yeah, on the yeah, yeah, script yeah, yeah. and stuff like that? And yeah. Edgar Wright, they stuck with a lot of his story. He got story and screenplay credits. And so, producing credits yeah, yeah, I mean, so as well. Yeah, that could be the same with Rick. They might stick with his version of the script and change some things. Who knows? Let's see how it works out. All right, what's next? According to THR, Disney is ready to take on another of its classic fairy tales with a new musical, live-action version of Snow White. Aaron Cressida Wilson, who penned the adaptation of The Girl on the Train, is in negotiations to write the script for the film, which will expand upon the story and music from the animated classic. The film will also include new songs from songwriters Benj Pasek and Justin Paul, who most recently wrote the lyrics for La La Land. No release date has been set. Christian, thoughts on a new live-action retelling of Disney's Snow White. A girl on a train rider, all I picture now is just <laughs> Snow White hammered. The whole time. <laughs> just like looking at dwarfs, thinking things are happening, thinking that actually Prince Charming, that, uh, that she's all this weird imagery. It's not an apple, it's a hard apple cider. Right. Yeah. She's, she's just, just pounding those sloshed back. Sloshed the whole time. And get your life together. <laughs> um, I actually don't I don't think that they should do this. I mean, it's only because if this would have been three or four years ago, I think it's a great choice. But there's so many different Snow Whites that have happened with the Kristen Stewart one, the Mirror Mirror. Great movie. Uh, stop your yeah, face. Great. Um, all these different, all these different Snow Whites that I think that right now, I'm, it's almost like when they kept doing the Spider-Man origin story. I've seen it. I've seen it so many different times, and I'm sure that it's Disney. So the fact that they're going to take it more on the animated movie that we know and add a little bit more to it, I will be excited to see it or take my, my daughter to see it for sure. I, I'm just not as excited as I am, say, Mulan or Aladdin things of that nature, or The Lion King. Those are movies to me that I haven't seen and I've always kind of envisioned what it would look like in the mm. live action version. I've seen this a bunch of different times, different Snow White versions, mm. but I'm just not as excited as the other stuff. Mark? I got Snow White fatigue, but it, this is a no dust situation. Of course they were going to do this. Snow White is maybe the most iconic of all the Disney princesses, so you know she's going to get her own standalone movie. And when they announced that they were doing Cinderella live action, I wasn't excited. I didn't get out of bed that morning like, it's going to be a good day because Cinderella's <laughs> back in theaters. And I love that movie. I thought it was fantastic. I think they're going to do a great job with Snow White. Personally, I don't care about it. When I hear about Peter Pan, that's when I'm going to get upset, John. That's, that's a character we do not need to see anytime soon live action again. But Snow White, it makes so much sense financially. This movie's going to crush. Of course they're going to do it. You didn't hear they announced Peter Pan oh, is coming out in God. 2019. Christopher Walken. Yes, yeah, Christopher Peter Walken is playing yeah. Peter Pan and so, Smee. It's a dual role. I will never forget that Bob Hoskins played me and Hook again. <laughs> I love this idea. I mean, uh, you know, for me, like, to for Disney to actually do a live action version of their version of Snow White, I think is great. I mean, I've seen a lot of stinker versions of Snow White, so why not go back to the source material that we all knew as kids and do a live action version? I can't wait to see all the dumb dwarves, whatever their names are. Yeah, uh, look, I'm t I think this is a great <laughs> idea because while we might be a little bit tired of all the bad versions of Snow White we got, I'm excited to see a good version, mm -hmm. live action version. And look, Disney, they stumbled a bit 
with uh, Maleficent. But I think because they stumbled, they found their footing. Because after that came Cinderella. And I thought, like, I agree with Mark. That, I thought that movie was great. I didn't think it was just good. I thought it was great. I, I like really how you ignore Alice in Wonderland. Uh, well, don't ignore <laughs> Alice in Wonderland. That was just Tim Burton, folks. Anyway... <laughs> Um, but no, I really, really did enjoy Cinderella. And then they did the Jungle Book and they knocked that out of the park. And now we got things like that Beauty and the Beast. I'm actually shocked how excited I am about that movie. The Mulan thing sounds great. Yeah, give us the classic. Give us that great one. Only give it to us right. Because I don't think we've seen a good one yet. And because I do agree with Christian. They've taken a lot of swings. A lot of people have taken swings at the plate with a Snow White. Hasn't worked. I'm aching to see one get knocked out of the park, and maybe this is the one that can do it. All right, folks, it is Tuesday, which means it's time for us to talk about what is opening this week, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. We got a whole bunch of them open, but we're going to focus on two in particular today. Ashley, which two are we looking at? Dr. Strange. Dr. Stephen Strange, but in it comes. Cumberbatch's life changes after a car accident robs him of the use of his hands. When traditional medicine fails him, he looks for healing and hope in a mysterious enclave. He quickly learns that the enclave is at the front of line of line of a battle against unseen dark forces bent on destroying reality. Also coming out is Loving. In 1967, Richard Joel Edgerton and Mildred Ruth Naga Loving take their case to the Supreme Court after violating a Virginia law that prohibits interracial marriage. Well, you know, a little bit later today, we are actually filming our Doctor Strange spoiler review. Will not go up until the movie opens, so watch, look for that in a couple days. But there is already a Doctor Strange review up on our channel. Make sure you check that out, as I know a whole bunch of you have. You've heard us talk about it already. I really enjoyed this movie, man. I really, really enjoyed this movie. It does not crack for me, I've said this before, that upper, upper top tier echelon of Marvel films so far, which I would count the Civil War, uh, the original Avengers, but it's right up there to me with Guardians of the Galaxy, with Ant-Man. You know, I, it was just a fun film, and especially one that could have gone so wrong in so many different ways. Like, doing a Doctor Strange movie is a roll of the dice, and visually, they went right off the reservation with this. They went mm. in such totally different directions than we've ever seen any film do before visually and it's mind-boggling and jaw-dropping wonderful performances Tilda Swinton practically steals the movie for me just love it Schnepp you saw it with me yeah. the first time yeah. just your quick thoughts on uh, Doctor Strange absolutely loved it for me it is in the top tier it's like right next to Iron Man it's right next to uh, Winter Soldier in the standalone Marvel films I think it's great there's elements that are, are you know like some of the other superhero films that we've seen but for me at least I felt they stuck really strong and close to the actual comic books and for me I absolutely loved it what about you I liked it I definitely I liked it and what I, what I think for this particular movie what I admire about it is what the MCU has been doing every single movie is changing it up and it is different it is a very different movie there are similarities in story like we were mentioning before in, in any origin story but as far as the tone and what Derrickson does it looks really it, it's it's incredible, some of these visuals, and it's a movie that you absolutely should see in 3D also, by the way, but it's a movie that I think has certain, there's certain like kind of horror, horror elements in it, there's kind of a fantastical element, and I like what Benedict Cumberbatch does. There were certain things for me that does didn't really work, and I didn't really think the humor worked. Some of the humor, I think, hit the floor with a huge thud, but Overall, I enjoyed watching the movie. What yeah, do you think? I think the big problem with Doctor Strange is that Marvel has made different movies that I liked so much that it's not going to be in my top five favorite Marvel films of all time, but I really enjoyed the hell out of Doctor Strange. Visually, it's stunning. I thought Scott Derrickson was definitely the right guy to take the yeah. reins directing yeah. this. It's a cool origin story, and in a world when we get so inundated with how this superhero came to be, it was nice to have a very different take on how somebody got their superpowers. My big concern, and I had the same concern going into Ant-Man, was how is this going to tie into the MCU? MCU. When I saw Ant-Man, I was like, oh yeah, this fits perfectly. I am not ready to say the same thing about Doctor Strange. I, I, I have some concerns about how it's going to tie in with the rest of the heroes that we already know and love in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but time will tell how we feel on that one. And as for Loving, too, I think Loving is a great story. I think it's something that's important that people should see, and it's a really well-done movie. I know some people might disagree with me on the pacing of it, but I thought it was perfectly directed, and the two lead performances both could be considered for us. I have not seen Loving yet, but I am I've been so excited for this movie ever since I saw the trailer. Uh, and, and, you know, you got, first of all, you got Joel uh, Edgerton in there, who I just think he's 
dynamite. Mm -hmm. I, I just love this guy. I'm really excited to see the film at the same time. So yeah, that's what about you guys? You, you're looking forward I to Loving? I cannot wait to see Loving. I love Ruth Naga from uh, Preacher. I right, think she's yeah. a fantastic actress and I cannot wait to see this film. Uh, Loving is a movie that it is a story that needed to be told. It is a very important movie that people should see. The performances are outstanding, and I hope to hear about some of them come award season. The problem I had with the movie was it, when you watch the, the actual trailer, you think it's going to hook you in so hard. Right. And, from, and for me, it didn't. I felt, I felt at times, and I like Jeff Nichols a lot, I just felt at times it was a little boring. It was a mm. little dull. Um, the, not the story and what happens alone inside of it, because that... It, it angered me in the beginning to watch how how ignorant people were, yeah. and how what was going on at that time, and to see this love and how I mean, because both the both the two leads are incredible in the movie, but there was just something missing. Yeah. Well, by the way, one more thing about Doctor Strange, because a lot of people ask, there are two post credit scenes. There's a mid one and one at the very end. You're gonna want to make sure you stick around yeah. for both of them. All right, guys, we reached out part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's gonna run them down. Then those of us at the table are simply gonna say whether we buy it or sell it. So Ashley, what do we got? Just over a week after stepping away from Deadpool, director Tim Miller has signed on to develop a live action Sonic the Hedgehog movie for Sony Pictures. From THR's report, Miller and his longtime Blur Studio collaborator Jeff Fuller will work on the project with Fuller taking on his feature directorial debut. The plan is to make a hybrid CG animated live action family film with Patrick Casey and Josh Miller writing the script. A release date has not been set. Schnett buy or sell a Sonic the Hedgehog movie from Tim Miller and Blur studios i'll be straight up honest i could care less about sonic the hedgehog <laughs> but now that this guy tim miller and blur studios are involved it's piqued my interest i think you know tim miller if you've ever watched him in any interview he's got a very sardonic sense of humor and if that's applied even lightly not liberally but just lightly to make sonic the hedgehog work that's who you need to make it work to be a good crossover film for a whole family, not just toddlers. So now that he's actually involved, I'm interested in this property. Look, you can do a blend of live action and animation, and you can do it well. We've seen it with Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Yep. We've seen it with Enchanted. Son of Zorn even is a great recent example. But I, 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 I'm going to buy this because I love Sonic the Hedgehog, and I grew up playing Sega Genesis. I am very nervous because all I'm thinking is Smurfs. All I'm thinking mm. is what a great CGI world we created with the Smurfs. Then they came to Earth, and they interacted with a bunch of dopey humans oh. that we did not need in the first place. Are you telling me there's not enough in the Sonic the Hedgehog mythology to just give us that story that we have to have it interact with the live action world. Now, I trust Tim Miller and what his vision of this is going to be, which is why I give it the slight buy, but it does make me a little apprehensive hearing that it's a blend of live action and animation. I completely agree with you. This one is a risk. This is a roll of the dice because this could go very bad. This could go very bad, very south, very fast. But I'm going to buy it because I think the potential upside is really good. This could be something really fun. It could have some great nostalgia value to it. Having Tim Miller attached is great. So while I think this could go bad, I think it's worth the risk. So I'm going to give it a buy. I'm going to buy it because it's a big twist that no one knows about is that this whole ruse that he was leaving Deadpool crossover Sonic and Deadpool that's the movie <laughs> breaking the fourth wall yeah, no no I, I do, but I do buy it because I think that what I would be worried with Mark is if they didn't have Tim Miller then I'm thinking Smurfs because sure. that's yeah. what I was thinking of yeah. right away Tim Miller's not going to make Smurfs nope. he's just not He's it, not, it couldn't happen. That's he not will his leave, DNA. He will leave for creative differences <laughs> if they want him to make Smurfs. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to happen. So I think because you add him, because he also knows at this point, all eyes are on him. He leaves Deadpool 2, which is a big move for creative differences. And then he goes to his next project or you know, he's doing another project. In Flux. Uh, in Flux. Yeah. But, so he's going to have In Flux. And then but he, his next project after that now is Sonic. So if he can hit Influx, and then he knocks out Sonic, he's taking on projects he's gonna, because he's stepping up his career now, and he wants to show that he is top tier. He doesn't need Ryan Reynolds to do it. So you take on Sonic, a product, a, a product that is beloved by a lot of people, and he's gonna do it, and if he does it in this way with his his special effects team and everything too, I think this could be a lot of fun. I think he could add something pretty exciting. To and it. with Fowler being the guy that's actually directing the movie, he works closely with Tim Miller, so yep. I think that makes sense. You can trust that vision. And if we get a good Sonic movie, Sega Gen Genesis shared universe. We could get an Altered Beast movie, a Golden Axe movie, Altered Mortal Beast, Kombat, Golden Blood. Axe. It would be awesome. 
Get over here. Yeah. Warrior needs food. <laughs> All right, what's next? According to Deadline, a sequel to Escape Plan is in the works with Sylvester Stallone reprising what? his role of Ray Breslin, <laughs> one of the world's leading authorities on structural security and breaking out of jail. Pre-production will commence January 15th, ahead of the start of shooting, which is set for March 15th in Ohio and China. Mark, buy or sell an Escape Plan 2. Uh, sure. <laughs> why not? I'll buy it. Uh, I'll tell you why. I, it was, I was just as shocked as Mr. Campio was when I heard the news yesterday. But I will tell you this, is that Escape Plan made money overseas. So people wanted to see it in some capacity. And there's a Chinese company that's going to be doing a lot of the production for this film. So from an international standpoint, I understand it. I wasn't in love with the first Escape Plan. I finally got to catch it on cable. And that's the kind of movie it is. It's a nice red box. It's a cable watch. Nothing more. But if Stallone is looking at his landscape, and they're making a new Rambo without him. And so it's like, okay, I don't have that anymore. Expendables. That hasn't been the return on the dollar that they wanted for that. And Escape Plant is a lot easier of a movie to make than Expendables, where you have a bunch of geriatric egos all coming together. With Escape Plant, it's just him and maybe our boy Arnie. I don't know if he would return, but I do like this the guy. He's an expert at breaking out of stuff. I get a little bit of the rock vibe from this. So I think you could build upon what the first Escape Plan gave us. You know what? I, at first I was like, Really, they're doing this? But when you look at the box office returns, I think this movie cost around twenty million to make, and worldwide it made like one hundred and thirty-two million dollars. On that basis alone, it kind of makes sense. If you can make another one, make a sequel in that twenty to thirty million dollar range, no reason you can't expect to get the same kind of return if you're lucky. And to be honest, I didn't think the movie was all that bad. I mean, it's certainly not something I was jumping up and down about and really excited about. It was a nice 90s style it action was, movie. Yeah, it was really not that bad. I kind I enjoyed it for what it was to a degree. So, you know what? On those bases alone, as shocking as this news is, I'm going to buy it. Yo, uh, hey, Arnie, what do you think about this, huh? <laughs> I have to be honest with you. I'm going to sell this because there's, there's been no mention of me. Where am I? I'm nowhere. You talk about overseas. I make a soda commercial for Japan that makes millions and millions of dollars. Hey, so of course you put they me not, in there. They're not going to announce that right away. You know, they're going to get uh, us so, in. Come on. You put me in the movie, and then you do it. But I'm off doing the Conan and I'm looking at my shoes. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> Yo, I'm going to sell this, too. I'm going to buy it, actually. I, I'm going to buy it even though I didn't like the first, first escape plan. I think them going with another escape plan and making it a little bit better. It was entertaining. You know, I'll say that. I felt I felt the kind of like confined spaces that, you know, yeah, sure they've got this maximum uh, you know, security prison that they get, you know, Stallone in and then you know, I mean, obviously Arnie's in there and they team up. I don't know how they're going to make an escape plan too unless they're just remaking the original one. So I don't know how they're going to do it, but it interests me enough to say I'll buy it. I'll see it. All right, what's I'll, next? I didn't even get a chance. Oh, I'm gonna, uh, uh, <laughs> you did get a chance. That was Arnie. That wasn't me. I'm so gonna, what? You get, is that your way of getting two installments now? Well, he cut me off. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna, he got to talk to the camera twice. <laughs> All right, real quick, but I'm actually gonna, I am actually going to sell it. I am going to sell it because I didn't, I, didn't like, I didn't like Escape Plan. I didn't, and, I, and I understand why they're doing it for money purposes, but I don't want to see it, especially if Arnold's not going to be in it. And the fact that that was the movie that for, for years upon years upon years we were promised Arnold and Sly, and yeah, you got a little bit in Expendables, but you never really got that movie together, and that was what I got. I was so disappointed in that first movie. I don't want to see a second one at all. I mean, make Lock Up 2. That works. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now what's next? Well, accepting admission as a member of the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, James Cameron discussed his upcoming four Avatar sequels and how he hopes to utilize 3D technology. In the report from IndieWire, Cameron said he wants to push the limits of technology with the medium including the idea of using glasses-free 3D. Avatar sequels. I'm going to push not only for better tools, workflow, high dynamic range, HDR, and high frame rates, HFR, the things we are working toward. I'm still very bullish on 3D, but we need brighter projection and ultimately I think it can happen with no glasses. We'll get there. John Byersell glasses lists 3D glasses hitting the market during one of the Avatar releases. You know what? I'm, I'm going to buy it. Like everybody knows I hate 3D. I, I do not like 3D. I don't think it has any place in the movie business. I think it should go away. Mostly because, you know, I've said this before, you know, you have these cinematographers, these directors who go through years of effort to put together this story on screen with these bright, vivid colors and depth and whatever. And what's the first thing we do when we walk into the theater? put tinted film over our eyes that give a lot of people headaches. It, may, it just, it, to me, it desaturates the picture and all that kind of stuff. I've just never enjoyed 3D. But I've always appreciated James Cameron that 
he pushes the envelope. And even if I don't like what one of the results are, you're not going to get great results unless you do those sorts of things. And keep and he keeps pushing, he keeps pushing. 3D without glasses. I don't know if it's something that I would enjoy, but I'd be damn curious to see it. I'd be damn curious to see if that changes the game. Because if we can actually watch a screen and see it as the director intended it, without covering our eyes with this garbage that we have to put over our eyes now, that would be really fascinating. And whether that works or doesn't work, I hope James Cameron keeps pushing the envelope <coughs> and, and goes for these breakthroughs. I just really appreciate him. So I'm going to give this a buy. What about you? I'm going to buy it also. But not Arnold. You're actually no, going to no, no, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm going to buy it, though. And I'll tell you what, though, because I'm buying it because of James Cameron, because it does sound like <laughs> it does sound like Tony Ravioli or somebody who would be like, hey, I can sell you 3D with no glasses. <laughs> right? Right? Look at everything life. That's no 3D. You know what I mean? Hey. But, that, but it's James Cameron. So to me, the first thing I heard when I was reading the notes this morning, I said my wife is, are, is one of those people who cannot watch movies in 3D because she gets sick. So I said, would you be interested in it with no glasses? And she's like, I'd, I'd want to try that. That would be great. So I think how are they going to do it? And if there's one guy that can do it, it's James Cameron. So I'm going to buy it because he also has enough money to try to do it. So, right, I, yeah, I, yeah I, I, I like the idea of it. Shep? I'm going to buy I mean, I'm going to buy it for a couple of reasons, but I think, you know, it has to be an across the board type of conversion thing with the high death frame rate type mm. of thing. We saw Peter Jackson try to like play with that with The Hobbit, Oof. but it actually yeah, has to be, a, it can't be, it can't be a 48 or 60 frames. It has to be 120 frames because that's what the, the, the human eye, well, that's what creates our vision. So that's what we actually in reality see. So in order to be glasses free is that is what that projection rate has to be. And it'll have those true separations and then we'll actually with our just regular eyes be able to discern that. So it's a lot though, that's a lot to try to get you know, a giant IMAX screen to 120 frames per second. I don't even know if that's doable at this point. Um, I'd like to see it happen, though. I saw it once, you know, at, in a special effects, like, I think it was Douglas Trumbull had made this kind of cool film with Vincent Price, and I saw a projection of it, or maybe I'm, a, I'm dreaming this. I can't remember. You write it down, let me know if I'm dreaming this or not. But it was like a spider's <laughs> web and stuff like that. But it was 120 frames per second, and it's, it, it, it's, it looks real, so. I sell being one of the test subjects for James Cameron's new. I mean, that sounds like a Black Mirror episode. Like, no, come on in. We're going to put you in. You're, it's going to be 3D with no glasses, and your eyeballs explode. Mm. Makes me very nervous hearing something like this because you're just talking about the frame rate that your eyes can process. Everybody, you can say people didn't like 3D. Everybody got sick watching The Hobbit when it was in, like, double the frames per second or whatever. So if... if, if it just makes me nervous. Is seeing it on projected on a screen, I don't want to overload my brain in that capacity. I'd sell it happening by the time the Avatar movies come out. That's the question, is do you think it's gonna happen by the time these Avatar movies come out? I don't think you're gonna get glasses 3D by that time. You know, it's funny, I was talking to, to actually, I was, Wendy, I was talking to you earlier today, and that there's kind of that technology already exists, right? Yeah. Uh, hello. It's my voice. <laughs> oh, that's right. I forgot Ooh, we didn't have a camera on you yet. Yeah, but, you were talking, but what is it that, that, it, that we get that on right now? What? The Nintendo 3DS. That's right. So there's already kind of like a technology that leverages that. But what we were talking about, too, was the difference is the screen actually has like some layers of stuff to it that allows that to happen. Where it's like, how do you pull off glasses less 3D where it's still light being projected right. onto a flat screen? To me, you're right. It sounds like somebody's trying to sell you like snake it's like oil. Crazy Eddie or something. Yeah, but I mean, right. if, if he my can glasses do it, are insane because right. they're not there. They if don't even exist. If he can do it, <laughs> I'm fascinated. Okay, what's next? Uh, the Xander Cage story. Apparently. Oh, oh yeah. So yeah. Here's, here's the thing about Xander. Look, <laughs> so we got an email yesterday from the studio saying. New Triple X Xander Cage story or trailer <laughs> dropping tomorrow. So we're like, all right, let's put that into our show notes. And as of the beginning of this show, that trailer has not dropped. So now I know Ashley Mova has been keeping a close eye. She's been monitoring and searching the internet for Triple X trailers. Uh, how's, how's your search gone, Ashley? You know, there's a lot of Triple X videos, but I can't seem to come across <laughs> the right one. <laughs> <laughs> but she keeps searching right. like a trooper. Says you. <laughs> so we will just bypass this Triple X one. I guess we'll talk about the new Triple X trailer tomorrow. 
tomorrow. All right, what is our next actual story then? Doctor Strange doesn't hit theaters in the U.S. until November 4th, but it's already making the big bucks at the international box office. According to Deadline, the movie took in nearly $88 million in 33 offshore markets, putting it ahead of previous MCU installments, including Ant-Man and Guardians of the Galaxy. Schnapp buyers sell Doctor Strange beating domestic expectations based on the international opening numbers. I buy it, and like I called it, it's going to make over 100 million US. Um, you'll see. And, you know, it's not even reached Brazil or Russia or China yet, and it's getting $88 million. So I think it's going to be a gigantic hit. What do you think? I think it'll be a gigantic hit, but I think it's going to be, I still think it's going to be like between 75 and 80 overall. I don't think it's going to go too great. I don't think it's going to hit 100, but I've gone against him before and been wrong. There's a couple things with Doctor Strange to keep in mind. Number one is that it is so different and so new. and it's got, But the other thing has got going against it is this, is that you've got an Oscar bait movie in Hacksaw Ridge, which isn't going to make $50 million opening weekend, but it'll probably will think, and you also got Trolls opening with like a really, what is looking to be, what a lot of us thought might not be all that good, but is starting to look like it might actually be a really good movie. And a lot of families are going to go to that. I think, I still think cracking that $100 million is going to be a challenge. So I think the 80 range is probably still the place to go, but I hope Schnepp is right about that. What do right, you think? Which I would buy it beating its domestic box office expectations because even like a couple weeks ago when we heard it was between 55 to 75. I think we all took the higher side of that. So I would put it at 80 or 85 million. And I think this is very encouraging because you would expect it to have some international pull because Benedict Cumberbatch is British and you have a lot of crazy visual effects. But also remember when there was casting announced and everybody thought that the Tilda Swinton move was whitewashing this and, and it, how would that play in international markets? It seems like it's playing very, very well and a lot of people are interested in this new character so i think it's going to do very well here as well all right guys well listen we do this show live so at the end of this show we're going to save a little bit of time to take some of your live twitter questions for those of you who are watching the show live right now how do you get a question to us it's absolutely simple you make sure you're following us on twitter at collider video and send on in your question but before we get to anything else you know yesterday was halloween and our very own josh makuga decided uh it would be kind of fun he thought it would be fun to do something now <laughs> what you're about to see is a clip from mine and john schnepp's show film hq which airs on comic-con hq you can check out the full episode over on comic-con hq but this is a little sub josh makuga was up to this week check it out it's Halloween, and uh, I've had a little bit of fun around the office this week. Check it out. Why didn't they just end it with the clip? <laughs> <laughs> okay, first of all, Michael Myers doesn't use machete. But that is not canon. On today's episode, we talk Pixar's release date switcheroo. I'm not afraid of the actual darkness. I'm afraid what's inside the darkness. Right. Like there's somebody waiting to jump out at me. I don't like dark alleys. I don't. I hate the woods. Camping is my worst nightmare. Most. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, I don't. Who was it that got Josh? Uh, Beardo. It was a Beardo that got Beardo, Josh. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god! And did you see the way that Raccoon Mario just handled the pressure? Because I didn't know it was coming to that either. I thought it was coming later in the show and just cool, calm, collected. Um. Anyway, guys, hey, listen, don't forget, Movie Talk is not the only show that is airing today on Collider Video. A little bit later today, we've got the movie trivia showdown match, one that you guys have been looking forward to. It is Team Heroes versus Team Top Ten Woo. with this guy on here representing Patriots. Heroes. Oh, sorry. With, with the Patriots and that airs today at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time that's when it goes online make sure you come back and check that out yeah uh, JBX and uh, Snyborg whatever you guys <laughs> Snyborg. I know you got some other like stuff that you do but I, I'm I'm sorry that me and Bernard are going to smoke you it's you know it's unfortunate Ooh. Snyborg that's got to be his new like nickname yeah. and also don't forget guys our newest Crash Course video on the Boba Fett as Snoke Theory is now up go and check that out on the front page of our YouTube channel and Collider Nightmares does that go up today? That's today. Too, okay, today. and Nightmares goes up today as well. Then that drops at five o'clock, does it? 
Yes. 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time is when Nightmares air airs. All right, guys, listen, we've reached that part of the show now for mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. So, Ashley, what do we got in the mailbag today? Lord of the Bricks writes, Hi, guys, huge fan of the show. Been watching since AMC days. I'm a huge Star Wars fan, so I was wondering, since they push Episode Eight back to December of 2017, and the solo movie is supposed to come out May of 2018, which is only a year and a half away they haven't started shooting yet will they push the release date to december 2018 also do you think they will release future movies in may since it was originally planned or will they move to december since they are doing amazing at the box office thanks and keep up the great work no they're going to keep it exactly where it is and they have plenty of time because look it's a year and a half away but don't forget with stuff like star wars and lucasfilm not only are they busy with all the pre-production work they're probably doing a lot of the post the traditionally post-production work already like i know we just found out that you know we got donald glover playing lando but that was probably a decision that was reached three months ago in reality they've got a lot of things going and really the shooting of the movie in front of the camera is probably gonna take like three months and then everything else is going to be post-production and editing and the scoring and all that kind of stuff so as of right now i think they still have plenty of time Christian, what do you think yeah i think they have enough time i mean it's a year and a half so i think that as far as <coughs> I, I mean, personally for Star Wars movies alone, I think that they should just stick to December for the most part. I think in May, because Solo's supposed to come out in May. May, yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, I think you know, it's supposed to come out in a year and a half. I, I don't know. I think they might, they might push it to December, though, because I think that if you can live in that December spot, unless it goes back to the point that I was making on Jedi a couple times, eventually I do think, now whether or not this is the next year and a half, two years, or even five years from now, there will be two movies a year for Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And I know some people, well, that's too much. Well, if you look at the, what's going to happen with the amount of movies, whether they're going to do a solo trilogy, it, it, you're not going to have enough time to do other movies. It's going to take too long before you get a new movie. So I think if they start to do something to where May is the standalone film and then December is the, you know, the saga film, possible. I am 100% into that idea and I think that's what they're doing by keeping Han Solo in May episode 9 will still drop in December and we're going to probably get that announcement next year they're going to say right. we're moving to two Star Wars movies a year because why not why wouldn't they do that I mean why not reclaim the original May and then they have the December for the the December is for the Skywalker ongoing stories and May is for like Kenobi or Yoda or like these individual standalones. Well, Rogue One is going to be the test. Rogue One is the test because if Rogue One delivers, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about month thing here. If Rogue One delivers and it's the huge hit we all think it's going to be, mm -hmm. that's when you're going to start to get the conversations internally with Lucasfilm and Disney to see whether or not they can do this because this, and they've said it as much, Rogue One is an experiment. It's an experiment to find out can Star Wars deliver on that magnitude the way that the saga films have so that's when we're going to start seeing that the release dates played with i don't need to see two star wars films a year why would i want to go to a galaxy far far away Mance? twice in one year <laughs> uh i don't know that was andy Rooney. that is the America. scariest voice i've ever heard <laughs> i don't think this is the scariest <laughs> voice you've ever heard very scary. Well, i think gilbert godfrey is. Yeah, it's it's a um, rogue I'm, one is an experiment mark <laughs> ellis can you tell me why you're afraid of two movies a year from the star wars uh, people the two movies a year is a whole different conversation just because i like to get very excited i like to let some time build up before a new star wars movie comes out i think it's less a matter of whether they can physically be ready to release the film in May. I think it's more of a decision, like what Christian said, is that you look at Rogue One and what those box office receipts are, because if Star Wars can dominate Christmas year after year after year, if they wanted to go to two, two movies a year, that's when you start to think, okay, maybe the trilogy or the Skywalker centric films are going to be the ones that come out every Christmas. But the experience I think we all had with Force Awakens opening at Christmas was so magical and it just felt like such a great time that that even surprised Lucasfilm, I think, how much we responded to Force Awakens coming out around Christmas time. So I think you're going to see them try it with Rogue One again and then see what the box office tells them to do. All right, guys. Well, we've reached the end of the show, and I said we'd save a little bit of time for Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. So, Wendy, what have you picked out? This one comes from... Thanks for the water, by the way, John. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this one comes from uh, Lohud Debbie, who writes, With the live-action Snow White, how do you sell the idea of the damsel Snow White when you have Once Upon a Time and a badass Snow White? There's something great about the classicness of the story. And look, just because you know you have one thing that's overdone and we start to go in the other direction, 
with with almost anything that can go with the damsel in distress idea or can go with anything that doesn't mean there aren't great stories still to tell in that other pocket and i think that snow white story is so classic and so great um i think you can do it i don't think it's going to take a lot of selling because it is just that classic i don't know what you think well i think you can do it but as far as the the question goes uh, how, how do you do that now that this version is the tough snow white it's Two different stories. Yeah. Really, it's, it's mm-hmm. one version of Snow White, and then if they, I happen to think they'll change the character up a bit, um, not in the same way as Once Upon a Time, but I think that there are absolutely ways to do it to where you can separate. Yeah, I mean, I just really want to see them concentrate on those dwarves. <laughs> yeah, <that'd be> good. <laughs> just call it dwarves. Yeah, dwarves. dwarves. Yeah. Yeah, Legacy think, of the White. I think so. you'll see a tougher Snow White. I think you'll see a more independent uh, Snow White that doesn't necessarily need to rely on a prince as much. I don't know how you handle the kiss situation, but you could just put a crossbow in Snow White's hands, and I would be excited about seeing this movie. All right, what's next? Polly Sarah writes, whose career would be hit the hardest if Marvel kills off their character in Infinity War? <laughs> Wow. Good question. You know, this is going to sound really weird. Robert Downey Jr. Because, and I say that, it's a very odd thing to say, but as awesome as everything within the Marvel Cinematic Universe has been for him, you know, he hasn't done a lot or had a lot of success outside of the MCU. I mean, he did that one, uh, not The Judge. Was it The Judge? Yeah. Is that yeah. the name of it? He did The Judge, which did not work. And it wasn't that great of a movie, and it, people didn't rush out to see it. So, oddly enough, I'd have to say the person most affected would probably be Robert Downey Jr. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, but he'd be swimming around in his oodles of cash. That he, he already care. has. He wouldn't yeah. care. But, I mean, as far as his actual career, not, not financially. Financially, he'd be fine for the rest of his life. But in his... I mean, I don't know. I still think he's the type of guy... Because right now, here's why I disagree with that, is because Robert Downey Jr., I think right now... He isn't, I don't think, to be completely honest, I don't think his focus is in trying to do movies like The Judge, even though when he was in it, I don't, I think even parts of it, I felt Tony Stark in there. I think that he's so consumed by Tony because Stark. Because that was right his now. movie, too. He produced of that course, movie. Yeah, production I think he's company. consumed by Tony Stark in general right now. I mean, when the guy's walking around in the street, you see him as Tony Stark. But I think, though, if he didn't have Tony Stark at all, he's the type of actor who would be put in a role and you'd be like, oh, and he bounced right back and now he's nominated for an Oscar. He has that kind of talent. The guy that I think that would be hurt um, in his career overall, it's interesting because even though I think he's a movie star and I think he's really good, is Hemsworth. Mm-hmm. Because for Hemsworth, he can do comedy. He was, the, I think, the funniest thing in, in both Ghostbusters and, and that stupid-ass vacation movie. Right. Um, but he... He hasn't been able to carry movies on his Black own. Black Hat, Rush, yeah, even, a whole bunch of them. And but he was, he was good. so good he at was Rush. He was good in it. Like, I think his career, as far as being in movies, but the, the top tier kind of Brad Pitt type action, uh, movie star I thought he was going to be, doesn't seem like it went that way. But he's, I don't know, they all, they're all they all really talented. Remember, he still has that Star Trek movie coming too. That right. he's supposed yeah. to be. Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean, Chris Hemsworth is a guy who I think clearly has proven he can carry his own movie. It's just the box office receipts haven't reflected right. that. Like He hasn't opened a movie well that has not been in the Avengers universe so I would either pick him or Paul Bettany. Because, I was going to say that too. But, yeah. but Paul Bettany's a guy who's never really built. We, he never really seemed to want to be a marquee movie star name. Well, they he would, tried him for you know? Legion and then that other Priest movie. The Priest I, movie. I mean, yeah. he's yeah. been the headliner really good in, in. In, in movies, but I, I think that it would be him because I don't think that Jeremy Renner is going anywhere because he's got other franchises. Scarlett Johansson, of course, <laughs> is a lead. Uh, what, what do we got? Someone, what do you kids someone, someone said Groot. Someone yeah, said someone, said, Groot. someone in the shop board said be Groot. I think Groot is going to be fine. going to be baby Groot. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm gonna go with uh, Chris Evans or Chris Hemsworth or Robert Downey Jr. Any one of them, they haven't been able like Chris Evans. Evans has, hasn't had a movie that was like a blowout film. He's able to take chances, like he did Snowpiercer. He's able to make his own independent film, and I, I think he's totally fine with playing Captain America for three more movies or like taking a break and then coming back to the role. I think all of them are gonna be fine. And I don't think any of them are going to get killed in any of these movies and, anytime and soon. Let's not forget that Downey is now, there's there's interest in Sherlock Holmes 3. They have a writer's room going on that. So it's just like in case that Avengers doesn't go the way that Iron Man wants it to, he's got Sherlock Holmes as a backup. And those movies do very well internationally as well. You know, the other thing about Paul Bettany is I remember uh, right when Ultron was coming out, I think he was on Kimmel. And he was telling the story, Paul Bettany. I've loved Paul Bettany ever since, um, oh gosh, what was that one he did? Nice First Night? 
Oh, yeah, Knight's, Knight's Tale. Tale. Thanks you. Not, not First Night. That's a totally different one. Um, but he was telling this story on Kimmel. He goes, he literally, he said, I was walking down Hollywood Boulevard. I had just come out of a meeting with my agent who just got through telling me I'm never going to be a real actor again. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm never going to get any more good roles. He said, and but 10 minutes after that, my phone rang, and it was his agent, uh, not as opposed to his man. One of his his agent told him he wasn't going to get anything else. His manager then called him and says, "Do you want to be in, Do you want to be in uh, Avengers: Age of Ultron?" <laughs> <laughs> it's a great story. It's on YouTube. You should look it up and check it out. But uh, yeah, Bettany would be one mm -hmm. that could possibly be heard. All right, let's take two more. Okay, Kaiser Soze writes, <laughs> uh, <laughs> "Hello, movie talk. Could Doctor Strange suffer in the box office this weekend with Hacksaw Ridge and Trolls all releasing Friday?" Well, I mean, it, it's it's going to to dent it. It is going to dent it. Like whatever money Doctor Strange ends up making, if it's in the $80 million range, if it's in the $100 million range, whatever, whatever it makes, it would have made a little bit more were it not opening up against both an Oscar contender and a, a really probably might what, what might have a wider appeal than we initially thought, family film in Trolls. So, but will it suffer? I don't think it will suffer, though. What do you think? Nah, it's got the Marvel pedigree. It's not going to suffer. I think Trolls might do well. Hacksaw Ridge is going to do okay, but it's not going to. It's not going to suffer. I see it the opposite. I think Hacksaw Ridge and Trolls are going to suffer because of Doctor well, Strange. Well, sure, right. absolutely. Right. I, 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 if they opened without Doctor Strange, those would be making mm -hmm. more money. I agree with Hacksaw Ridge, but I don't agree with, with Trolls. I don't think Trolls is going to suffer at all. I think Trolls will have because I, for me personally, I think the Doctor Strange audience and Trolls for, personally totally for me sure. is that I'm going to take my kid to go see Trolls, I'm not taking her to go see Hacksaw. <laughs> Hacksaw Ridge. Hacksaw Ridge has the same type of audience as far as you know, adults, uh, adult males that mm. want to see the movie also. So I think, to me, um, Hacksaw Ridge, and not only because of subject matter, let's not turn away from him. Mel Gibson's had a lot of controversy. I know, I know a lot of people that don't want to see his, mm -hmm. his movies for sure. He knows sure. his name is not plastered on this movie in any of the marketing or yeah, anything. Yeah, so I think that Hacksaw is going to be the one that takes the biggest hit out of it. I, I think it's a movie people should see. I think it's a movie that will be that, that Andrew Garfield will be recognized at, at the Oscars, but I don't see it doing that great at the box office. But Hacksaw Ridge isn't directed by Mel Gibson. It's directed by the director of Braveheart. Braveheart. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question of the day. Last one comes from MovieFan0330, who writes, could there be fourth wall breaking jokes in Deadpool 2 about Tim Miller no longer directing, or will they not touch it? No, I, you know what? Because I really do believe their statement when they say, hey, this was a good parting of the ways. We had different creative different. We had creative differences, different visions, and it was creative parting of the ways. I think that's reinforced by the idea that Fox instantly gave him influx and all that kind of stuff. Because I think they maintain a good relationship despite their creative differences, I do buy the idea that they might have a couple of Tim Miller jokes or one significant, even if it's in the opening credits, directed by yet another overpaid hack mm. or something like that. I do believe they'll do some reference. I think it'll be in good fun and I think everybody will be okay with that what do you think i think there might be a cameo by like a sonic the hedgehog like stock doll in the background <laughs> i think it's fine uh, yeah there'll be a nod to it some way or another mm -hmm. a little kind of rip yeah i don't believe it was amicable so i don't think that there's going to be those many jokes i think even if it wasn't amicable i still think they're going to do it yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. still think they'll probably feel stab at it all right guys that'll do it for us for this installment of collider movie talk thank you so much for joining us listen don't forget the most important part of our show is what you have to say about these topics. Make sure you jump into the comments section and leave your thoughts on any of the issues we discussed here today. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, over here, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys find me on Instagram and Twitter, just at John Schnepp. Coming up in two weeks, Designer Con here in Pasadena. Get your tickets. I'm debuting some crazy stuff. And apparently you're also going to be on Nightmares a little bit later oh, today yeah. as well. Nightmares here on Collider <laughs> Video at 5 o'clock. Thanks, John. And also right here, Mr. Christian Harloff. Well, and Catch This Maniacs match at 2 2 p.m. I guess he and Burnett go up against the Patriots. The winner will be going to the Schmodown Spectacular to battle the champs team uh, 10. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and where can people find you online? Oh, yeah. Find me at Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram. And over here, Mr. Mark Ellis. At Mark Ellis Live, you can find me watching the new Triple X trailer, maybe, and then also <laughs> announcing the team match later today with Christian George Harlow. The world's foremost authority on Triple X trailers, Miss Ashley Mova. Ashley, where can people find you? <laughs> Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. And Wendy Lee, where can people find you? On Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And uh, you can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, simply at John Campia. Make sure you subscribe to Comic-Con HQ for my and John Schnepp's show, Film HQ, weekly movie magazine show, only on Comic-Con HQ. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks a lot for joining us. My name is John Campia, and until next time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. 
Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.